Um, well, thank you guys so much. Uh, we're so excited to have you here today for our webinar for the Presales Collective. My name is Rachel Tillman. I'm based in Austin, Texas. I lead our solutions consulting team for the Americas uh, Enterprise at Braze. We sell marketing. And I'm actually going to be walking you through some of these things today with our great host. Uh, but before we get started, we want to know a little bit more about you. So any second now, a Zoom poll will be populating. We'd love to know what best describes your current role. So are you currently a solutions consultant uh, in leadership? Are you looking to get into solutions consulting? Um, just take a minute and pop that in the poll after we've already kind of shared where we're all joining from. Awesome. And as we go and uh, go through this, we will be talking through a topic I know that's near and dear to all of our hearts, which is really getting the back to the basics of the demo. Uh, so our plan for today, I'll take you through our agenda. Um, we're going to do a little bit of welcome, get to know everybody. Uh, and then the bulk of our time is actually going to be in that tactics to ace your next demo. So uh, we have some demo experts on the line with us, and uh, we have a really good conversation that we're going to be talking through. We will have some time for some Q&A, so please make sure as you're going through, pop questions in the chat, um, jump into the Q&A section, feel free to ask questions, and then we'll kind of kick it off with a big thank you at the end. Uh, so this is our plan for today. And as we go through, I just really want to say thank you guys so much for making Presales Collective possible. Uh, we are truly a global network, as you can see on the call here today. And I personally, I'm really excited that you've all decided to join us. Um, I love being able to host these and really see the power of what we can all learn from each other. So I want to thank our panelists for also spending your time to share some of your expertise with us. Um, so, and then with that, uh, I'm also going to just pop in. I know I mentioned it earlier, but we would love for you guys to ask questions using the Q&A function. Uh, it should be at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen, depending on where you have it. And then just be active in the chat. That's something that myself and Kevin from Presales Collective will be monitoring as we go through today. So any questions, any chat, we would love to have your engagement. And with that, we will go ahead and get kicked off. Um, so today's real, our goal today is to really get back to the basics. And uh, the demo world is as vast as our own universe and sales engineers, solutions consultants, we really need to stay on top of the best in class practices to continue to deliver that top tier work. I know I personally feel like I give demo after demo, and sometimes it's easy to kind of get in a rut or keep doing the same thing, maybe feel a little bit like you have your Harbor Cruise demo, demo down and you're doing the same thing over and over. And so today we're really hoping that we can add some fresh perspective to that, make sure that we revisit some of the fundamental tactics that are going to allow us to give our best demo every time. And uh, we'll be covering some things like how you warm up how you manage your demo environment, how you collaborate with your sales partner or account executives, how you can prepare. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the fun stuff like saving a demo when you feel like it's going off the rails. And then uh, my favorite topic is how you close successfully. So how do we make sure that we don't give a fantastic demo and then just kind of let the audience fizzle, but how do we really end on a strong note? And so with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to my panelists today. I would love for you guys to introduce yourself, uh, just share how long you've been involved with the Presales Collective, what your role is today, and where you're based. And Pabell, I'll toss it to you first. All right. Thanks, Rachel. So, yep, my name is Pabell Martin. I am based in the UK. Shout out to the UK chapter. Um, so I joined the Presales Collective March of 2020, kind of when things were kicking off. So super, super excited and to be here, one, to be on a panel, which is just exciting, uh, but two, just be a part of the community. It's, it's really, really great. Um, I'm grandfathered in, I think, today because technically my role now is as a sales enablement consultant. So I'm responsible for onboarding and reinforcement for all of our field roles at Sprinkler. Uh, but that's only as of the last two months, which is why I think I just made it under the line. I was a principal SC here for Sprinkler covering our global strategic accounts uh, just before that. 
Uh, and I've been in pre-sales almost nine years. Um, so you're going to hear a lot about things not to do because I'm chock full of those. <laughs> also, if I give Pabella an extra hard time, it's because we actually used to work together. So uh, I'm just, you know, preparing everyone here. Uh, friendly relationship goes way back. Um, Jenna, I'll toss it to you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenna Kinsley. I am based in Austin, Texas. I am a solutions engineer for Showpad, which is a sales enablement software. So for context, I'm primarily speaking to sales, marketing, and enablement personas around their existing sales motions and, and processes. And I have been um, in this role or in pre-sales for about a year and a half um, and about the same length, um, just speaking um, to and being involved in pre-sales collective. Awesome. Thanks, Jenna. And Neil, I'll toss it to you. Thanks, Rachel. Hey, everyone. I'm Neil, I'm co-founder and CEO of Novatic. And for those that aren't familiar, we at Novatic help teams create interactive product demos. So a key part of our customer base is pre-sales teams. So always excited to jump on these kind of calls and speak to the product community. Uh, but for context, I'm based in New York, very myself. And one of the cool things that I love is I get to work on the pre-sales capacity within Novatic too. So being the sales engineer for sales engineering software is kind of a, a fun meta. Um, but that relates to where we were, which was around two years ago, um, we started Novatic. And prior to that, I was at Oracle before that as a solutions engineer. Um, so excited to share some learnings both in that and some um, afterwards as well. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm really excited to have this you know, really great group of people here today. And I'm going to start with kind of a juicy question for our panelists. So um, do you guys have any examples, maybe Neil or Pabell, of a time when you thought you were totally crushing a demo and then you were given some feedback maybe in the moment or later where you realized it was not going as well as you thought? Um, would love to kind of open up with that learning moment. Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to jump in and public your see your, yours as well. Um, but I think one that was really interesting to me was in the early days at Oracle, they have a pretty big boot camp that you go through to get trained on like what are the essential tenets of being SE, what is the key components there. And I think this is my third ever demo that I provided. And they brought me into the call. They're like, hey, Neil, like just we need you to do a quick demo of the analytics offering at Oracle. So I hopped on, my manager was there and AU was there. And like, oh, just get like a quick Harvard tour demo. Like, okay, sounds good. Happy to give a quick overview. Um, we didn't do any discovery during the call. And for, for the entirety of the demo, I gave a 15 minute monologue that walked through the key parts of the demo, which is basically the, the demo certification that I did in training. So I came out of that so happy, so excited, like, hey, like manager, how did I do? Like, what was your, your thoughts? They said, well, Neil, you did a great job delivering the demo, but it didn't actually achieve anything. I think the thing that I learned there was you can give a, a great demo, but unless you promote engagement and really encourage the audience to get involved and you map this to the problem they have, that'd be great. And in this case, their main use case was connecting to Snowflake data. And we didn't even cover the, in the integrations and connectors section. So I think for me, this is a great learning that, you know, hey, you can cover the key parts of the demo, but unless it's covering their problems, it doesn't really matter. Um, so that was a, a big learning early on. Yeah, great example. Uh, Pavel, I saw you come off mute. Any war stories you want to share? Yeah, um, this one's seared into my memory. I remember the elevator ride, the walk from the lobby, and the car I got into is north of Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, basically, I was in the demo answering every question they were firing at me. Like it was a little game of stump the chump, like we're normally kind of used to. And it was just kind of like, yes, yes, no, this. But, and I just was man, I'm, I am killing this. There's not a question I haven't answered and we're on time. The demo finished early and we're close. This feels amazing. And I mean, the doors hadn't closed before the rep was just kind of, my AE partner was just like shaking their head. And like, literally he said, you think you killed that, didn't you? And I was like, oh yeah, man. He was like, yeah, but like you answered every question without asking another question. Like you just kind of spit everything back like a database or like a not, like that's not what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You clicked everything and said yes or no and but like that's not the point of what we were doing today and I remember just my mind kind of like going numb blank for a second like oh like I was focused on what I thought my job was not the point of the meeting from their perspective or even ours selfishly as a team so yeah that's that I'll never forget that one and we'll do everything I can to avoid that experience 
uh, forever because it was not fun. Well, I really appreciate both of you guys sharing a little bit more on the vulnerability side uh, to start today about those kind of lessons learned. And I think if I listen to both what both you and Neil shared, it sounds like it comes back to a fundamental, which is in the prep for the meeting. And in my mind, maybe if you had agreed on what your goals were to learn a little more with the rep, or Neil, if you had known what some of the use cases were and been able to do some of that discovery, that prep would have actually really equipped you to maybe not have had that experience uh, as valuable as the learning experience might be. And so I guess I'd love to know a little bit about how you guys successfully prep for a demo. Um, what are you normally thinking about ahead of those meetings to make sure that you feel as prepared and ready to go as possible? Yeah, I can jump in here. So something that I always do is um, listen back or watch back to the discovery call that the account executive had with the customer. And I'm looking for a few things in particular, um, how the customer is describing their business and their sales motions and ultimately keywords or, or buzzwords that they use to describe those things. For example, simply just what they call their sellers or their reps. So I can ensure that Right off the bat, I am speaking the same language as the customer, and I'm making it as simple as possible for them to imagine their sales motion and their, their sales teams within my demo environment. Um, something else that I like to do is come up with like a story that I am anchoring on throughout the whole demo, just in case it does get derailed because we know that is all inevitable to happen. Having a story to kind of refocus and get the flow and the train back on track is really helpful for making the whole delivery of the presentation and the demo seem as seamless and not choppy as possible. I love that. Uh, I think both of those are really good call outs, Jenna. Um, Pabell, Neil, anything you guys want to add on the prep end of the spectrum? Yeah, I might've gone to the other end of that spectrum after like maybe that first traumatic encounter. Um, but I think for me, one of the things I hold myself accountable to for sure every time, almost robotically, is kind of a two to one ratio. So if it's an hour long meeting, my total amount of prep time is minimum two hours. And it's kind of tricky at the beginning, but I think for all of us in this role, right? It's table stakes that we know our product and our space and cannot answer questions. But I think when things started to flip for me was when I spent as much time on the slides, what I'll call like the setup or the soft stuff, as I did on the tech and the demo setup. And what I found is that when I tried to make that half and half at the beginning, it then started to shade more towards, hey, I'm doing less demo setup and spending more time on the, the soft skills, everything Jenna had just mentioned around what's my story, what's my prep, do my slides look good? Because I always usually would get into that habit as well. It's not just the Harvard demo, but now I'm using the standard slides. And then people can feel that. And the reverse is true. They can feel when you've prepped, when you've customized, when you tailor the discussion, right, to, to the one that you're having. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm also a big advocate kind of on top of that, that there should be two different types of prep sessions, depending on how big the demo is. But really, I view like a brainstorming and strategy with my rep separate from a dry run or a practice or actually like going through like this is exactly my click path that I'm going to demo. And I like to view those things as separate because then it gives me a chance to know where I'm supposed to be jumping in. And it also gives me a chance to understand where my AE should be jumping in. Um, and so kind of on the back of that, what are other ways that you guys are leveraging your AE relationships for a better demo? Like how do your AEs make you demo better? I think one thing that I found to be helpful is just setting the right expectations up front for who's going to own and quarterback like that relationship, I think has been really great. So in my experience, there's almost two different kinds of engagements where SDs can get looped in. One of which is where you're on like the five yard line, people have like already been sold. But they want to validate like, hey, does this integration work? Does this connection work? And so in that case, the AE is owning that end to end. You're kind of just like plugging in, going, you know, subbing in, validating that this works and then moving on. So in that case, it's totally okay for the A to own that entire like thread. But then there's another case where the SE really quarterbacks it. So maybe this is a longer trial, maybe this is a POC, whatever the case may be. In that case, it's so much better for the SE to own and quarterback that relationship. So I think to whatever extent possible, just like setting that up front and saying, hey, for the next two weeks, I'm gonna be running this. You can kick off the call, do intros, but for most of the call, I'm gonna be running this as um, the main 
dedicated lead on the opportunity. And then once we got the tactical win, I'll pass it back to you. But setting up that ownership delineation, I think has been helpful just to, to make sure that both teams are on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like that. And to borrow some of what Neil is sharing there as well, right? Defining the roles is so important. And I found that tactically, you know, it's a generalization, but, you know, if there's two roles as an AE and an SC, we each have a separate set of superpowers, right? If we're working well in the partnership. And I find that for them, what they can do extremely well is to cut through the noise and get to what the problems that business is having and how we attach to them. And then mine, hopefully, is to go get the technical win and prove how my solution can do the two. So in my experience, if you can understand what those superpowers are, but then plan that tactical meeting for when do I deploy this, it avoids the situation of, I'm going to open the meeting up and hand it over to my SC, and then they're just on their phone or on the laptop for the rest of the time, right? You never want that because there should be doing more discovery, attaching to the biggest problems, emphasizing everything they either got in discovery or anything beforehand. And there's very specific moments in the meeting where that makes sense versus where it doesn't. And sometimes it's more credible coming from the AE than the SE and vice versa. That's that's how I like to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm hearing a lot of prep, a lot of assigning roles. I would also love to know, are there any like habits or tips and tricks that you guys have developed that have really made a big difference for delivering some of these demos? There's been a few high level ones and there's also some like smaller um, little habits that have helped too. But I think one of the ones that's really helpful up front is what we call the tell, show tell method back at Oracle. But uh, it's, I think a pr pretty common demo terminology throughout, but essentially just like tell them what you're gonna say, do it and then tell them what you told them. So, articulating you know, from beginning to end what that story looks like. And I think the reason that's really impactful is that when we do this upfront, you can give people a mental agenda of what to expect throughout the demo. So in like the case in Nevada, if you say, okay, we're gonna look at some customer examples. We're gonna then pull back the curtain to show you how you build out interactive demos. And then we'll finish on analytics. Um, is there anything else you'd wanna cover? So in that way, you can really like set the agenda, but then also open the floor to them to see if there's things that would make sense to, to cover on their end as well. So I think just setting that framework up front has been one helpful tip. I think another thing that's really helpful too is just being a power user of the tools available on Zoom in particular, but other meeting platforms too. Um, but there's a cool thing that I discovered a few weeks ago called the Zoom Spotlight feature that essentially turns your cursor into an expanded version of it. So I think there's other tools that were third-party tools today, but Zoom has a native version now. And so it's really small, but as you go through the demo, it's showing you exactly where you are. You can draw attention to certain areas, which is kind of a fun one. Um, there's also like arrows and other invisible pens that also help to do annotations. If there's a more technical component that you want to, um, you know, screen share with the prospect. So I think just being a power user of those tools also helps where it makes sense in the sales cycle. Um, and then the last one, I, I think is something that you all mentioned before, is just being a, um, is doing the preparation and putting in the, a dry run for these high level strategic deals. So I think for smaller level deals, like you could just do the Harbor Tour, Harbor Cruise, whatever you want to call it. Um, but when it makes sense, spending the time and doing that full preparation to make sure that it will go right and all of the context is provided is worth it 10 times out of 10. And I feel like my worst demos are ones where that call was missed or we thought it'd be totally fine. Um, so just putting in that time beforehand seems to pay off. But curious to hear the other panelists' thoughts on this too. Yeah, Jenna, Pabell, anything you guys want to add on that one? Yeah, the, the pandemic has kind of hit hard on some of the, uh, the in-person tips, tips and tricks, but I like the, I mean, this is again tactical, but like a cup of water or juice, empty or not, to kind of force some breaks and force a little bit of the uncomfortable silence. Um, I like that two second pause after someone asks you a question because they get a little uncomfortable and sometimes will give you a little bit more information than um, they may be have planned. And um, another one is just, again, just in the word choice, right? Not, are there any questions, but what can I answer? Yeah. And if it's silent, it's like, oh, great. You know, it's the greatest demo you've ever seen. And it was perfect. And I answered, you know, and like you just kind of be a little bit more human to kind of draw folks out because obviously, right, camera and remote is just tough after a while. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, go ahead, Jenna. I was just about to say, I definitely would echo that two second pause um, thing that Pavel had mentioned. Actually, that's something that my uh, VP does with us on our one-on-ones when he just wants to get more out of us. And I've 
began, we have began to incorporate that into our demos just to get more out of people because sometimes they feel silence is uncomfortable and, and they'll begin to speak more and give you more. Yeah. So make, make them uncomfortable. <laughs> Well, speaking of uh, being a little bit uncomfortable, um, I think we've all been in scenarios where there's that stump the chump that Pavel kind of mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, whether the demo is going well and the prospects are really excited, but then you get a technical person on the team that starts to derail the conversation. How do we kind of keep things either getting them back on track or keep things on track when you have someone, whether it's a detractor or just someone that has their own agenda on the call that may be involved. Uh, how do we kind of keep things back on track? Any tips or tricks for you guys there? So for the record, I'm not gonna make you uncomfortable and wait the two seconds, Rachel, but I could have and thought about it. So yeah. <laughs> I want that there for the recording. Um, now this is one of, my favorites because like it does happen all the time and initially I would get really really frustrated at this person until I started to learn that they're either identifying themselves as a potential technical champion because usually that most skeptical person is trying to understand like can this work for me and help me or they're maybe adding themselves as someone else's champion either the status quo do nothing or for a potential competitor both useful pieces of information so I don't necessarily want to shut that down it's not always a terrible thing but you do want to manage it so one of the ways um, that I've tried to do this to varying degrees of success is you, you actually saw this at the beginning of today's presentation is if you set up expectations in the front, so you're doing a two hour workshop or an hour demo or whatever it might be, you have likely agreed on the agenda and the sections, break that down and put the time. And then up front, you can just say, hey, we obviously have a lot to get through today. So you can see we're going to spend time in these areas. Would anyone like this to be adjusted? And you know it's usually silent because everyone either agrees or maybe tells you something. And then once you've done that, when it starts going off track or they're trying to drag you into the pit of details, then you can say, hey, you know, we've got just a few more minutes. We know we have a lot to go through. I want to answer those questions. And then you explicitly just say, can I follow up with you later and set up time to go into those details specifically? And you kind of test whether they actually want the answer or not. And you can always call back to, hey, remember the agenda. There's a lot of things that everyone in this call cares about, and we have a very specific time for each let's not waste it and then lose out on something later yeah i i always call that the reprioritization like asking them to reprioritize how you want to use the last 15 minutes like on the spot say great i know you have a question about this but we also still need to get through these three things how would you want me to spend that time and i think that can be ultra powerful uh in making sure that you're getting on track but you also feel like they feel heard um, so I just want to call out that we're getting some great questions in the q and I know our panelists are jumping in and trying to answer some of them live. Um, I'll also make sure I have probably three or four more that I'd like to get through, and then I'm going to jump in into your Q&A. So keep those coming. I love what I'm seeing coming through. So thanks, guys. Um, and kind of on, on the same note, um, and this is a question for all of you guys. I guess, Jenna, I'll start with you. What are some ticks? Oh, my God. Tri tricks and tips uh, that you can use to keep someone's attention during a demo. So making sure that people are engaged, or if you have a bunch of different stakeholders and you want to make sure the whole audience is engaged, what are some of the things you do? Yeah. So my account executive and I like to ask the either new stakeholders or anyone who's new to the buying committee, um, what they're looking to get out of the call. It's really, really easy to search for them ahead of time on LinkedIn and, and find their title, but I love if I can get extra tidbits of information out of them. And I will make a note of what it is that they want to see on a notepad that I keep right next to my laptop. So what Pavel wants to see versus what Paul wants to see. And then I make sure that I explicitly call out their name once I get to that point in my demo flow and ask something along the lines of, hey, Pavel, you mentioned you wanted to see X, Y, Z. How does this compare to what you had in mind? Love that. Pavel, Neil, anything else that you guys add for the engagement tips and tricks? plus 1000 to that. So if you want to take a four second break and ignore me, just literally do what <laughs> Janet just mentioned there, right? Like that is brilliant. Um, tactically, I like to, you know, whatever style, say the thing that everyone is thinking on that call, but would likely never admit to. So a perfect example that I use literally all the time to the annoyance of all my AE partners is if I say the word AI, like there's something on the slide that like an eye roll emoji or something, 
with a bill that I'm like, okay, hold on. I just said AI in a tech presentation. Everyone roll your eyes in unison and like, let's get that all the way. And it just kind of like draws attention to like, I know what you think you're going to get is the normal standard thing that you're annoyed by and don't have time for. This isn't that, right? Try and kind of, you know, almost eight mile them, right? For all, all my battle rap fans out there. Um, so other ones are just in person. I like to bring like, you know, for all my football, meaning soccer, uh, fans, I like to bring like a referee's book to the room and like I hand it to somebody and or put the cards on the table and say, you know, one yellow, I'll kind of move it along. Second yellow, I'll close my laptop and walk out. Just give me the straight red. We'll end the meeting in the moment, right? Or bring penalty flags if you're into American football, like things like that to give them a little bit of power, but show some personality and then just let them know that you're here for them and that we can end the meeting if it's a waste of anyone's time, I think gets them to realize, well, hey, this maybe this isn't a runaway train. This might be something I can pay attention to since you know, he or she's giving me uh, some responsibility here. I love that. I wish I had some flags to throw right now, Fabel. Uh, Neil, what do you got on the uh, tips and tricks? Gosh, got some great tips and tricks here. This is awesome. Um, I think one of the things that I would add that's helpful is a lot of the time, great engagement is built in the early innings of the demo. So to the extent you can get people talking early on will really help throughout the entire demo presentation. And I think one thing that we found to be helpful, or at least you know, back to Oracle and Silt Nevada today, is when you have group demos, it can often feel like you're talking into the abyss. No one wants to talk, as a lot of folks have mentioned here. It can be kind of awkward. So I think setting up and doing intro, intros to start is always good to get people talking. And then doing some light discovery after recapping priority is really great. So it's saying like, hey, you came here to figure out how you can streamline your account receivables automation. You have like XYZ challenge. Does that seem right? Like, Greg, hey, you're in the finance team. Like any priorities or things that you would add on to this? So just doing some light discovery on top of that just gets people talking. And then to Jenna's point, as you go through the demo, you can then bring back those priorities to what's being shown in the demo. And that way you can really make it interactive. So trying to just bring on and add on that engagement throughout is something that will go a long way because the default is that people just don't want to say anything and will be cameras off. Yeah, no, I think these are some great tips and tricks and uh, really creative. And, and I think that's what I love to see. I also, okay, I was going to say, Rafa, loved your question. So Pavel, uh, you got the question, did you ever get a red card? Um, and it sounds like you have. 100%. And I remember it again, it was 17 minutes in to the actual meeting that was supposed to be two hours packed up. Like we're walking to the door. The AE was just flustered and furious and like, come on, what are we doing? But like, we just did it. And then we got to the door before they were like, just kidding, just kidding. We just wanted to see if you were serious. Like come back in. And, you know, it was much more jovial after that. Um, nice. One way to yeah, break the ice. <laughs> terrifying at the same time. <laughs> Well, I think on the kind of opposite end of the spectrum, right, we talked about some tips and tricks and some really creative ways to keep that engagement. Would love to know what you guys see as some of the biggest pitfalls that you've noticed uh, when someone's delivering a demo. So, Jenna, I don't know if there's anything that comes to mind for you when you say like, oh, OK, this is something I, a trap I see people fall into a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So something that might seem minor um, but I have truly noticed that it really does make a difference is just simply not speaking the customer's language. So I think this is really impactful in how a customer receives the demo that you're delivering to them. Do they have to do some work to make it make sense or do some translations in their head um, based off of what you're demoing? Or are you keeping it as simple and digestible for them as possible? Something else that comes to mind is being in the enablement space we are constantly talking to customers about their sales motion and sales processes. So there are times where I will be pitching or demoing to a customer who doesn't fall within our ICP or ideal customer profile. And there have been times where I haven't confirmed the sales motion of that industry or that customer ahead of time. And I could waste 30 minutes walking down a path of what I think is their sales motion, but I didn't confirm it ahead of time, either like ahead of the call over email or at the very beginning of the demo. So I think asking, hey, before we dive in, I just want to make sure that I understand how your team goes to market. So please confirm X, Y, Z 
if you get it right, that's great. You, you look prepared. And if you get it wrong, you still look good because you're avoiding wasting those 30 minutes walking through, um, a demo flow or a demo path that isn't relevant to the customer, which most of the time ends with them saying, yeah, this looks great, but this doesn't fit into how, how we do it today. Absolutely. Yeah. If I, if I could chime in here too, I think one, I, I borrow from the lessons of every SC leader you've probably ever heard complain about the fact that it's so hard to hire, right? To fill out their teams. And it's kind of like the second layer of that, right? That I think I truly believe like we're all here for a reason in your roles, right? It's a hard position to fill because it requires so many, you sit in the middle of customer conversations, sales, conversations with product, conversations with your engineering team. You get pulled in by marketing. Like you have this huge assortment of skills, but I think the temptation can be, well, I'm here because of my technical acumen. And it's just not the case. Like in our roles is there's a certain level of creativity that we need to bring, some expertise, some of our, something in our background makes us exactly suited for the spot we're in. If you're not an SE yet and you're becoming an SE, there's absolutely something in your background that the team needs. So you just got to bring that to bear. Don't just be the technical man or woman that answers all the questions, right? That's not, that's not the job. Don't be embarrassed by sales in your title. Like be creative, bring the soft skills, bring your opinions to the forecast, do all of that. And it helps your demos because you're now thinking with your entire brain and not just your click path, answer all the technology questions brain, right? You're trying to solve a business problem with a solution and asking someone to give you money, right? That's not a technical job, right? That's a very multifaceted job and you got to do all parts of it. Yeah. And I think, um, I, I completely agree. I see really technically minded people, like that's our comfort zone. And so it's really easy to just stay there. So I think challenging yourself a little bit to get out of that is, is really critical. Um, the other pitfall that I'll share that I see, it's my pet peeve is someone asking, does this make sense? Um, and I'll share that the reason I find it to be uh, so challenging is because the sentiment is spot on. You want to make sure people are tracking with your demo, but 90% of the time, people are just going to nod their head and say, yeah, this makes sense. Like no one's going to own up to the fact that they're lost or the fact that they don't understand what you're talking about. And so I think I always, the biggest pitfall I see is when someone in AE and SC, anybody just says, oh, does that make sense? Um, I'd really challenge you to reframe the way you're asking that question. And so on the back of that, um, Jen, I'd love to know what kind of tools and resources have you found to be the most helpful to improve your delivery overall? Yeah. So probably the biggest thing for me is a call recording software. Um, my company actually has one within our product suite that we use, but anything like a gong or a chorus is going to be super beneficial. Um, I watch them back for, or I watch these recordings for those dis um, discovery calls that my AE has to prep, um, but also to watch back on demos that I do as well as my my peers, so other SEs on my team. Um, listening, I, I absolutely realize that listening back to demos that you did yourself can be highly uncomfortable. I don't think anyone really likes to hear um, the sound of their own voice. Um, but I truly believe that it is one of the most influential tactics that actually drive results. Ultimately, you, you just have to get uncomfortable to grow and make changes. And typically listening back to demos that you had done previously will do that. Um, so I just keep a note of both constructive feedback as well as areas for improvement. Um, but then additionally, I am always combing through my own peers' demos and taking notes about how they positioned different aspects of the platform. Um, separate or differently from me. I'm essentially always learning from my team and adding snippets of their talk tracks and their value statements into my demo flows. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. I think it's so important to not only watch yourself, no matter how uncomfortable it might be, but to watch others and, and kind of pick up those tips and tricks. Um, so speaking of, you know, picking up all this, this great knowledge, one of talk a little bit about how we finish strong and really close out a demo successfully so that you don't do all this great work and then you just kind of like drop it in the last five minutes and are say, okay, like what's next? Um, so Pabell, would love to know how have you seen us close out demos really successfully to have that lasting impact? 
Yeah, I think um, a simple report card, and maybe it's not so simple, but the, you know, I have the agenda with the timings and the minutes, right? That helps me deal with it going off the rails. Right after that, I put the report card and not only do you have your yellow card or whatever to send me out of the room, but here's what we're going to end with. Like you should leave this whatever long meeting with the following X, Y, Z. And then at the end, you kind of bring that report card back up and then just say, okay, here's what we covered. We hit through our agenda or maybe we didn't, we left something out, right? You just kind of talk through that and then ask, was there anything that we didn't? Did this successfully achieve that end? Yes, no, whatever. Then right after that, step through all the homework because you likely you likely wrote things down. It's a great way to involve your AE if they were taking the follow-ups. And just be like, hey, can you just recount what's all the things that we now owe you after this? And then directly ask for time for whoever you've identified as a technical champion. Come up with a reason to say, can I reach out to you with the following? Or can I set up time to answer that thing that we didn't get to go in depth with, right? The role that you're serving as an SE in your team Make sure that you have an explicit way to look at the person that you're targeting to kind of build the relationship with, right? To ask them for the follow-up afterwards as well. Yeah. And speaking of follow-up, what does your post-demo follow-up look like? I mean, Neil would love your point of view on this. Yeah. Well, I think it's really helpful to clearly articulate like in that follow-up, like what are the key priorities? Um, what are some resources that are helpful that maybe came up during the call or things that would be helpful to shorten those next steps? And then what are the immediate next steps? So just like literally creating titles for those different areas and then listing them out in bullets. And I try to keep it as short as possible. I think there's a tendency to just like dump information in that follow-up, but really like working with their AE partners, I think like figuring out how you can just condense this information as much as possible and be proactive around next steps. I think one of the things that um, we've noticed to be really helpful, um, both at Nevada and back at Oracle, was when a prospect would mention like, hey, you know, we need to have a security review. Or we have X thing as part of the next steps in their process. Just trying to get ahead of that as much as possible is always helpful. So maybe if they mention their security posture, just like proactively sending along your like security docs, you know, SOC 2 report, things like that goes a long way just so that you can minimize like those next steps. Because it is one of those things that does add up over time. And like, I think that's the difference between like a three-week deal cycle and a six-week deal cycle, just the small improvements. Um, so yeah. just trying to proactively identify those. And I find that as the technical in a, the sales cycle, we can actually really influence how short or how long a sales cycle is totally. by how much trust we're building, but also some of the documentation we're able to provide and some of those yeah. quick wins to just to like get it out the door. Um, anybody else have anything to add on some of the follow-up and otherwise we'll jump to some of the Q&A. Yeah, all that in terms of internal follow-ups, there's specific kind of um, approaches I'd like to take, again, somewhat rigidly. Um, I learned it from a sales VP very early in my pre-sales career about one good, one bad. But after every customer interaction, you share one good, one bad thing that happened in the meeting. And you specifically say good and bad so that it builds this like muscle and somewhat of a callus to not feeling some kind of way because someone said you didn't do something well. Everyone just gets used to this is what we do because it helps us get better and get to the right outcome. And then you realize that eventually you're just at this point in the relationship with your AE partners that you're just going through it and everybody working to sharpen each other. Um, and then the other piece is you're in a super unique position, likely because you're not one to one. You might have a four to one or a three to one, whatever your ratio is with your AE partners. So you now have a view into the business similar to their frontline managers. So it is incredibly important for your own credibility internally that when you talk about a deal, an opportunity, a customer meeting, speak in whatever language your company uses for the deal forecast, whatever methodology you use, right? Like just speak in that language so that you're not just the tech resource, but you are part of the team looking to win business and help a customer achieve outcomes. And then come a forecast call, they not only ask you to be on it, but they ask you for the thoughts on a deal. Right, You stand up with your AEs during a QBR because you know the business in a way that those frontline managers are then going to start to respect, which again, will only help you, again, kind of selfishly in your career at that company and every other company you work at afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. What a powerful way. Speaking of closing strong, Pavel, very powerful. Um, I, I love that message. And I love that sentiment. Um, there are a bunch of really good questions in the Q&A, so I'm just going to start to kind of rapid fire and get through as many of these as we can, and if we don't get to yours, I am going to, uh, we will 
send out a typed answer. Um, so if anyone on the panel, feel free to jump in and answer these. I'm going to start with yours, Mike. Um, are there any cues that you look for, body language, speech patterns, that let you know you nailed a demo while you're still in the call? Yeah. Um, if you've got the second screen or the video and you're lucky enough to have the cameras on, Pete, for anyone wearing glasses, and if the light isn't changing, meaning like it's the same color the whole time, they're locked in. It starts flashing white. They're checking their Gmail inbox or their Outlook up on the screen, right? Like nobody's all in dark mode. So that's just, a, again, it's like maybe a tick of mine, but that is always something just magically in the corner of my eye I'm noticing is that something's flashing in the glasses and lets me know that they're probably not with me. And I can pause, take a fake sip of water, whatever it is I need to do to try and figure out how to get them back. It's real water, I promise, not gin. Neil, Jenna, anything you want to add to that? Body language, cues, things you look for? No? No, that, that's a pretty good answer. That's good. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I also look for um, like kind of the tone and how they're asking questions. Uh, I think the way they ask, are they saying, are they asking we questions? Are they starting to say, I would do this versus, well, we would do this. Those start to indicate to me how they're thinking about um, your potentially using the software and kind of envisioning themselves. Um, so I also look for those verbal cues as well and any of those buying signals. Um, there's another really good question uh, from someone about when you have a super dense product with lots of technical nuances, lots of features that could be applicable to demo, what are some tactics you use to keep that demo on track? Any advice or tips and tricks there? There's, you got a Pavel. Oh, I mean, I feel bad because I'm, I'm stealing from Jenna here, but like that journey is the cheat code. If you're selling a platform or super dense product in your slides, if you have some way to prompt where you are in a journey of an end-to-end -end process, or if it's six people involved using the software, who is it? Like what personality are you taking on in that moment? There's something about those visual cues to kind of bring them back that can really help orient them at every time. Because to you, it's the most natural, easy product in the world. And of course, like everyone, but to them, they don't get 80% of what you're saying, unless you orient them on what you're doing, why, who you are, that kind of thing. Sorry, sorry, Jenna. I'll pay you royalties later. All good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the other thing that I would add on to that as well is like, in addition to that visual roadmap, I think it's super helpful to know that like, you don't have to always demo everything. I think that was a realization that I had is like, I had this mental checklist of the 10 things I always wanted to go through. But if people only care about like the integrations or like the analytics section, like you can just show that and spend the time there because that's what they really care about. That's what they want to validate. Um, so that realization is helpful. And maybe you'd use that in conjunction with some of the visual components to articulate, hey, you know, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes here. And that's what you guys care about. So let's let's stay focused. Yeah. I completely agree. I actually always challenge my team to pick exactly what you're going to show. Don't be tempted just because you know every feature or every button to show every button or we'll be here all day. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't provide the value for why you're showing something, you shouldn't be showing it in an early demo. If you're doing a validation, it could be a different event. But if you're you know, trying to really truly understand how the customer is going to use this and, and where meet them where they are, if you can't explain why you're showing something, probably don't need to show it. Um, let's jump to, uh, so Jeff had a question around when the demo is not going well. What are some tips and tricks? Anybody have anything that you've done? I know we've talked a little bit about getting things back on track when we have a super technical person, but if you're giving a demo and there's just like zero engagement, any, any ideas, anything that you guys have done to get people back on track? Yeah, I would say, you know, prep this with your partner for sure. Um, but there's a little bit of a talk track around, hey, you know, clearly you all are not a good fit for us, right? Like Jen was saying, like, if you're not in the ideal customer profile, there's a way you can say that, that will either one, confirm that to you and give you the time back, right? And you should value your time and qualify out as fast as possible. 
or it sometimes trigger that kinds of that kind of natural human response like wait they're breaking up with me like hold on wait our company's awesome like they can't just say like you know I mean like there's just you, you plan it and it's artful like there's not really a, a template at least that i've seen like it's it's more art than science but there's a way to exit the conversation and start to shut the meeting down or give that signal that either then brings them back in or lets you know that yeah you, you probably should shut it down and find another avenue to, to go work that opportunity I always go back to like, I don't want to waste anyone's time. So I just want to make sure like this is actually valuable for you guys. And like, is there something else we should be focusing on? I think just owning it, naming it, calling it, I think that's normally enough to kind of people are like, oh, I didn't realize I wasn't paying attention. Or, you know, that sometimes they'll be honest. They'll be like, yeah, there's a lot going on right now. Um, but that helps me understand their priorities. And to Bell's, to Pavel's point, like maybe it is time for a little bit of a breakup. But uh, yeah always something to vet with your AE and sales partners. Don't just shut meetings down because no one's on camera or something. <laughs> it's not what I'm endorsing or recommending. <laughs> Neil, Jenna, anything you guys want to add to some of that? I think the, the broader point that Pablo mentioned that you guys discussed as well is just like zooming out and then maybe using that time to also do discovery. So like, hey, you can like maybe raise the, the flag and say like something's going wrong here. But then also try to figure out like why, like maybe there's a project that failed a few months ago around the similar topic, or maybe they're pretty in, you know, like in a deep evaluation with another vendor, like figuring out the driving reason behind that may shed some light and may just be the needed step to bring more engagement and to, to bring things back to life, or it may just disqualify it entirely. Um, so just being very curious around the, the why there can be helpful. Awesome. Yeah. I would echo that too. And similar to what you said, Rachel, just kind of like getting a pulse check saying like how is this going are we hitting the major points that you wanted to see if not happy to pivot just let us know what you want to spend the rest of this hour half hour covering yeah no i i think the naming it is the critical piece that you just nailed the head on uh jenna um, I'm going to pull two more questions. Uh, one, I'm taking a little bit of a risk with your question, Sean. I know my answer, but I am going to toss it to the panel. So putting you guys in the hot seat. Um, I'm the one who brought up the does this make sense reframe. So this is my responsibility. But uh, his question is, how would you reframe? Does this make sense? Is there anybody that wants to take it? <laughs> I'm more than happy for you guys to jump on it or, or I can answer it since it's my fault we got that question. I like, I just like, what can I answer? Because it assumes the sale and it forces the silence. And I usually follow up with like, I'm okay with some silence as well. Like just some version of name it. And then what can I answer? And just assume that there's a question. Yeah. And on top of that, I like in addition to, you know, answer, asking things that way, I think also bringing it back to the priorities. It's like, hey, one of the things that you guys were excited about when you started was looking at how our analytics functions work. Um, do you have any questions around our analytics offerings today? It's really just like calling back to like, hey, this is a party for you guys. Now we're looking at this, anything match up, any questions, so on and so forth. Um, so just making it more clear to them that it's a party. And I can even make it super tactical. Sometimes I'll say, how do you do this today? And yeah. get them to explain their current process and then say, well, how would you incorporate what I just showed you and truly see if they can almost sell it back to me a little bit? Um, on do they really understand the best meetings I've had or when a customer can actually re-explain what my product does. And I'll even say something, I'm like, great, I'm out of a job. You don't even need me anymore. You understand what we do, like we're good to go. So it's more of that like education tech, I think. Um, yeah, I love David, you just popped in instead of, does this make sense? Is this useful or how would this be useful? Those kind of questions can really help get a better answer um, for that. And I'm going to host a whole webinar later on why I would write my book called, Does This Make Sense? Um, on top of that, our last question for today, and then we'll jump into our wrap up here. Um, Kathy, I love that you called this out. She's starting her first rail role as a pre-sales professional next month. If you could give her one piece of advice, everyone on the panel, what would it be? Have a growth mindset. Uh, that's one of the better books, not just for work, but just in general. Um, Carol Dweck, shout out Carol. I've never met her, but have a growth mindset, meaning the pre-sales job is very simple, but it's not easy. So you're really just going to have to be prepared to like, you're going to learn, you're going to grow. It's going to be awesome. You're there for a reason. 
but just be prepped for that and uh, be humble enough to take it, but confident enough in your abilities of why you're where you are. One thing that I learned is that communication and delivery is perhaps one of the most important parts of the role and that understanding the product and getting the technical know-how is great, but unless you can communicate effectively, it doesn't really matter. So a lot of the points that Pablo mentioned earlier and Jenna too, to a certain extent, just like getting your framing down, making sure you're speaking the language of the customer, looking back at your own call recordings, like just putting in the work to make sure that your presentation and communication comes off in the right way um, is one of the biggest payoffs. So I think that could be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I think both of those points that they just made um, are great. I would say, obviously, cosign all of that, um, but lean on your your uh, the team members that you'll have on your SE team. Watch back on some, if you have a call recording software, watch back on how they position stuff. That was huge for me in just kind of helping me get around that lear learning curve a little bit faster. Um, because there will be, to Bobble's point, there will be a lot thrown at you and you'll be kind of drinking out of a, a water hose, if you will, um, for the first few months. But that's also like the most exciting part because you're learning all of this stuff that you didn't necessarily use or, or come across before. Um, so yeah, take it all in. Yeah. And Kathy, I'll just add like leverage your network, keep doing what you're doing, join these kind of events. Um, the Pre-Sales Collective has been an incredible resource. Uh, for me personally, and I think just being able to share ideas in these forums was is one of the things that gives me the most energy as a pre-sales professional. Um, and with that, we're actually we're going to start to wrap up today. So I'd love to know quick poll in the in the Zoom. How did we do today? Uh, really would love your guys's feedback. Would love to know what kind of webinars you're looking to attend in the future. And I also want to throw a big shout out and thank you to Neil and his team for making this pop uh, possible today. Uh, so Neil, I'll toss it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Well, big thank you for everyone for taking the time to join today. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, we at Nevada help pre-sales teams create interactive demos. There are some of our customers today. If you want to go to the next slide here, Rachel, um, to really see pre-sales teams using Nevada to create interactive demos that can be used as a post-demo lead behind. So part of that follow-up asset and really enabling teams and providing the resources to instantly show the product where it makes sense in the sales cycle, usually across the full funnel. Um, so if you're interested, or next slide, I guess. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, we do have an interactive demo of our own product on our website that you're really welcome to check out. Um, also feel free to connect with me directly on LinkedIn or reach out to our team via the website. But um, thanks again for Pre-Sales Collective for putting this on. And thank you, Neil, so much for not only being on our panel, but for the support Nevada and, and your team provides to make webinars like this possible for all of us. Uh, so thank you. Um, I just want to shout out, we hope that you'll see us at our next event. So October 11th, uh, we have the Chief Solutions Officer, How Pre-Sales Influence is Shaping the Business Inside and Out. Another great panel on deck for you all. I really want to thank you all for coming today. I want to thank Pabel, Jenna, Neil, everybody for your time. And honestly, I'm blown away by the questions we've gotten. I know Kevin uh, popped in the chat that if you didn't get your question answered, please go over to the Presales Collective Slack channel. We would love to continue these conversations. Find us on LinkedIn. Um, everybody here is really a resource for you all. And we just really appreciate the time today. So with that, uh, we hope to see you at any of our back to school events. We have a number of in-person and virtual webinars that are happening. So you can scan the QR code, visit our website. Um, but we look forward to having you, whether it's in person at a connection event or developing your skills or building your knowledge and your leadership network. Um, thank you guys so much. And it was really a pleasure to be here with you today from the Pre-Sales Collective.